It's minus 20 degrees Celsius at seven in the morning. The winter bite is palpable and the wind is menacing. Dark too. The earth in these parts won't greet the sun for another two and a half hours yet. At that point, the sun's rays will begin to pierce Stockholm and reveal its light and warmth to the wary residents. While it's still dark, we'll have to look elsewhere. Fortunately, here in Stockholm, you don't have to look too far. The Lus Café, a nondescript coffee shop, sits in an equally nondescript street location. To someone standing outside, freezing their mitts off, coffee is an inviting proposition. But that's only the start of it. Five minutes from now, that same person could be shoeless and find themselves waving their animated hands over an array of breakfast items, ranging from organic cereals to freshly pressed juices to organic yogurt. What's more surprising about this apparent coffee shop, however, is that beyond the storefront, you're greeted with intense white neon lights, dispersed enough to be comfortable. This is the closest we're going to get to natural daylight, and it feels good. It's now you realize that this isn't a coffee shop. This is what they actually call a light cafe. And far from a novel break from the wilds of wintry Sweden, the artificial light here might just be essential for your health. Stockholm this time of year gets around just five hours of light a day if the residents are lucky. That equates to around 2000 lux on a good day and only 300 lux on a cloudy day. Lux being a measurement of light that's cast onto a surface. This perhaps means nothing to you, no problem. What you need to know is that the body needs two and a half thousand lux per day in order to secrete the hormone melatonin, which helps the body to regulate its sleep and waking cycles in synchrony with light. Further, doctors recommend that we shower our bodies in light at this intensity for at least one hour per day. For the whole of winter in Stockholm, day and night, whether it's 7 a.m. or 1 p.m., the sun practically never provides enough light to kickstart melatonin production. In the north of the country, it's even worse, where many towns receive absolutely no light all day. This has a whole raft of consequences for people living in the these regions, as we'll look into during this episode. Some consequences include SAD, seasonal affective disorder, which causes depression, anxiety, and allergies. Vitamin D deficiency, which can cause rickets in children. In adults, it can lead to osteomalacia and osteoporosis, where the bones become weak and painful. Serotonin deficiency, natural light helps to produce the body's feel-good neurotransmitter. Loss of libido, increased insomnia risk, and glucose intolerance. That's a veritable laundry list of problems, and most of us don't even realize that a little something like not enough sun can be the cause of them. It's especially important to realize that as we increasingly spend more of our days cooped up in our offices, staring at screens, that this problem will become even more pronounced. What's more, research into bipolar disorder, Alzheimer's disease, and fatigue in relation to how light affects these conditions suggests that light therapy could very well help in offsetting these problems too. And that's where light cafes come in, to provide a sun replacement for a part of the day in order to help our bodies maintain homeostasis. For around 20 bucks, you can have an hour's therapy and breakfast and bounce into the rest of your dark day without the accompanying dark moods. With between 0.5 and 3% of the world's population suffering from winter depression and seasonal affective disorder, it's just one of several light therapy solutions which serves an underappreciated need. That's the claim anyway. The question is, does light therapy in all its forms really work? Well, that's what we're looking into in today's episode. out of the way, we're on to part two, science, to see what objective truths the story might highlight. But first, with an all essential caveat, science isn't broken, but it's a hell of a lot harder than we give it credit for. To paraphrase the data analysis blog 538, what does this mean? Well, humans aren't rational creatures. Scientists are no different. We see patterns, we unconsciously jump to conclusions, we screen data to confirm our hypotheses, and as a result, struggle to replicate findings. Point is, just because I mentioned the word science doesn't mean you should take these studies as gospel. Lessons can be taken, but sleep with one eye open. Correlation is not causation. Read my favourite book in the world to understand more. Antidepressants have come under increased scrutiny over the last few years, not only because of their side effects, which may or may not include suicide, painful irony that one, but also because in many cases they don't actually work all that well over the long term. And that's not to mention the growing cynicism with which Big Pharma are being viewed with their backroom handshakes with doctors to push their gear on unsuspecting sufferers. In cases where a patient reports depression that's seasonal in nature, it's become the obvious practically side effect free treatment to prescribe. Take Ryan Sherman for instance, a 34 year old lawyer who found himself suffering with seasonal depression after relocating to New York from Texas. During winter, 
later, the days grew shorter as the nights grew longer, and his mood gradually enveloped him. He tried antidepressants initially, they didn't work. After a psychiatric consultation and submitting a questionnaire, he was handed a light box. Within just one week, he felt his mood had lifted. Sherman said himself that it was an overwhelming sense of going from being a pessimist to being an optimist. While it does require a dedicated habit, the benefits have outweighed any inconvenience. By way of example, he admitted that recently he had failed to maintain the practice and felt that his mood had begun to slip. Predictably though, as soon as he returned to light therapy, his mood quickly returned to comfortable levels. For decades, researchers have understood that there has been a relationship between light and animal behavior. Exposing a rat to light during the night will actually stop the brain from producing melatonin, the hormone, as we've learned, that helps to control sleep and wake cycles. The more melatonin that's secreted in the brain, the more tired we feel. Humans have been similarly found to react in similar ways. It's this simple physiological reaction to light with a high enough temperature, that is whiteness, that presents artificial white light as a viable alternative to the powerful sun that we obviously couldn't hope to replicate on Earth in any other way. But while simple in nature, it's difficult to appreciate the domino effect of our sensitivity to light itself. Consider what sleep expert Charles A. Zeisler of Harvard Medical School said, that every time we turn on lights, we are inadvertently taking a drug that affects how we will sleep and how we will be awake the next day. Every day our circadian rhythms must be reset to maintain a behavioral sync with the Earth's rotation. This helps to ensure we'll get the signal to sleep when it's dark and feel awake when it's light. It's a process known as entrainment, and it's a very simple physiological process in principle. The problem is, we light things up at night, and in the winter it's often dark when we get up. Our biology has not kept track with our technology, or even with the seasons. This distortion affects how we eat, how we sleep, and how we work. Having said that, however, exactly how light works is still beyond us, though frankly if the entire world of medicine could be summed up in one line, that would perhaps be it. Exactly how the body responds to medicine is still a little beyond us. The only reason so many of our treatments have side effects is simply because we don't truly understand what's going on at a molecular level. So that's another reason to stay away from pills in favour of something like light therapy, which can't really have side effects, generally speaking. Some people have reported feeling nauseated in the first few days of treatment, but this could be because of nerves, or it could be a misattributed reason entirely for feeling sick. So the ultimate question here is, does it actually work or not? As a recent article on the fantastic website Nautilus.com recently said, According to a handful of studies cited by the American Psychiatric Association's practice guidelines for non-seasonal depression, it may. One trial from 1992 submitted 24 veterans with major symptoms of depression to light therapy using lights that ranged from 2000 to 3000 lux. This was contrasted with another group of subjects with similar symptoms who were tested with a dim red light placebo. Very simply, the white light group demonstrated reductions in their symptoms along three separate measures. The red light group showed no corresponding improvements. Another score for light therapy then. In another experiment, still, 69% of pregnant women subjected to light therapy reconciled their depression after one month of usage. Compare this with only 36% in the placebo variant. Although it's worth noting that a 69% success rate is a 31% fail rate, that's not insignificant, and by understanding the power of anchoring from the work of Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, it's certainly worth seeing it from both angles. And that brings us on to the gotcha. The trials that have been conducted thus far have been very small in scope. Given the replication crisis in social science right now, that's a disconcerting revelation. So as I say in my caveat at the beginning of the science section of my videos, take these results with one eye open. Just because larger experiments have not been conducted doesn't mean the treatment is ineffective, which of course is a good thing, but it does mean that we don't know for sure whether it's a sure thing. Unfortunately, the money just doesn't exist to do larger studies, and the people who make the decisions for how much money is available for this sort of thing is not necessarily the type of person who will appreciate the importance of large-scale experiments. Fortunately, the treatment is cheap, as far as medical treatments go, so for people who are not getting results from antidepressants, it's perhaps worth testing out. Given that results are typically experienced within just one week, my recommendation would be to make a concerted effort for at least one week by scheduling time in your day, every day, for just a week, and sticking to it before making any judgment calls. However, I'm not a 
trained medical practitioner, just some guy on YouTube, so get advice from your doctor, preferably one that hasn't been paid off. On a more serious note, your doctor may not have come across light therapy in medical school, so just because it's not recommended doesn't necessarily mean that your doctor is a shill for Big Pharma. Before we go into the practical takeaways here, it's important, I think, that I talk about the science we have on how light affects horrible conditions like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, among others. That's a big claim. I wish I could tell you that there was a boatload of data based on hypotheses that could inherently be disproven and weren't, so-called falsifiable data that stands up very well to scrutiny. Unfortunately, I can't. What I can say, however, is that there is an increasing interest in this space. Mariana Figuero, a photobiologist at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, New York, believes that light therapy might be used to heal far more than depression by actively resetting circadian rhythms. Using a converted 70-inch flat screen TV, she has demonstrated that one characteristic of older patients with Alzheimer's is a notable disruption to these rhythms, further inflamed by the fact that they typically get outside less often than healthy variants. Still other scientists are exploring whether light might reduce fatigue in post treatment treatment cancer patients, as well as testing the theory that correcting disrupted circadian rhythms in patients with Parkinson's might mitigate the symptoms. Now for the practical takeaways. I thought about recommended light therapy or the cheaper alternative to purchase a light box, but if you made it this far in the video, well, that's kind of implicit, isn't it? So I want to offer one company you might want to check out for light boxes catered specifically to alleviating seasonal affective disorder. Although there are a lot of options out there, many of which you could perhaps get through your doctor. It's also worth noting that I'm not involved with this company on any level. The only reason I recommend them is because they've conducted and published clinical trials for their products, which helps to separate the wheat from the chaff. In an industry where there are so many bull products on the market. That company are Lightbook from Canada. You can find them at lightbook.com. That's L-I-T-E-B-O-O-K. Com. So that's one practical takeaway. I want to finish up now by focusing on the consequences of a disrupted internal clock, which is naturally a common side effect of seasonal affective disorder, whether through correlation or causation. My hope with this takeaway is to give you even more of a reason to catch seasonal affective disorder before it metastasizes into other issues. Increasingly, scientists are finding that an interrupted internal clock is tied to a worrying number of serious mental illnesses. So what may begin with seasonal affective disorder can diversify in effect into a host of snowballing problems. Some of these problems include Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, as we've seen with the amount of sunlight we're getting each day, but that also necessarily applies to the quality and quantity of sleep we're getting each day. It's the other half of the pie, if you like, which is intrinsically related. Recent studies have discovered that the buildup of proteins in the brain which cause these diseases could be the accumulated product of a disturbed sleeping clock. I say this not to intimidate you, but to call you into action. So here's specifically what you can do within the next 24 hours. The first thing to do is to stop waking up with a rigid alarm clock. It's clear that many of us think we need these, but our bodies are far better at telling us when to wake up. Ask any chronobiologist. Increasingly, there are products in the marketplace which monitor your sleeping patterns and can wake you up between assigned times. There are devices you can wear. The Apple Watch is rumored to get this functionality by default later in 2017. Or you can even use apps which use your phone's microphone or accelerometer to monitor your body movement during sleep. Just assign the spectrum appropriately and your device will wake you up during a light sleeping phase. Second, try to go to sleep at a reasonably consistent time and aim for that eight hour sweet spot. Thirdly, consider doing an hour of light therapy before you go to bed to calm yourself down. You can read the latest escapist book you found on your Kindle if you like. You can also switch it on in the morning where you spend most of your time if it's dark. Or consider investing in multiple lights for different rooms if the budget allows. Most of us have to budget our expenditure each month and sleep can often slip down the priority list beyond little hacks like choosing what we eat before bed and changing our habits here and there. But if there's anything you might take away from this video, let it be that the quality and reliability of our sleep, as manipulated through light, affects every aspect of our daily lives, including the degree to which we become prey to conditions like seasonal affective disorder. You owe it to yourself and the people you interact with often to dedicate yourself to prioritizing sleep, not just with the latest gadget, but with a combination of technology and conscious intention to change your daily habits. If you want something you can do literally right now, if you're in your home, consider rearranging your room so that, in effect, you reset your accumulated habit pattern from the preceding months and years. Clean the slate, fix your sleep, and take control of your light exposure using the various tools we've explored today, and give yourself every chance to start the day with the energy to kick ass. 
Good luck, and I hope to see you in the next video. If you enjoyed today's episode, why not consider purchasing one of the books that inspired today's show? It helps the authors who write, me who produces, and you who implements. Thanks for watching, share your thoughts below, strike a like, and if you're feeling really daring, hover over the subscribe button and see what happens.